Dobar dan. Ok. Spoštovani, pozdravljeni tudi v mojem imenu na ente konferenciji. Mene je izredno veseli, da smo se lahko zbrali v eni take malo bolj intimnem okolju, da lahko še mogoče mečkem bolj odprto poklepetamo v določenih zadevah. Danes jutraj nam je profesor Gareli na predavanju na temo konkurenčnosti predstavil načine, kako se organizacije v tem sodobnem svetu, ki se spreminja, je neizmerno hitro, kako se v bistvu prilagajajo s svojim tržiščem in kako uspevajo na mednarodnih trgih. Predstavil je ogromno svetovnih trendov od milenijske generacije pa vse do politike centralnih bank in kako le te vplivajo na konkurenčnost. V Microsoftu se vedno privoščimo in nekako poskušamo dodati ta svoj delček mozaika. Vedno pravimo, tehnologija je tista, ki po našem mnenju pomaga organizacijam, podjetjam in vsem državam postati še bolj konkurenčen. Ker nekako vemo, da je konkurenčnost tudi pri vas na prvem mestu, smo za vas pripravili tole okroglo mizo. Pobabili smo štiri izjemno usposobljene strokovnjake, ki bodo za vas spregovorili na temo konkurenčnosti tako v Sloveniji, kot tudi širše v regiji. So with respect to my English speaking guests, and I also apologize, I didn't know that you will be sitting there, I really apologize, so I will start speaking in English language. I would like to invite to the stage Professor Garelli, founder of IMD World Competitiveness Center, Mr. Joe Macri, Vice President for Public Sector for the EMEA region, Mr. Michael Kugler, General Manager, Multi-Country Europe Region, Microsoft CEE, and Mr. Andrei Božic, General Manager of Steklarna Hrastnik and Current Manager of the Year. So, dear guests, thank you for being here with us and accepting our invitation. And let's kick off. So, in this year's um, competitive research, Slovenia actually follows the positive trend, let's say, for the last few years. Um, and we actually progressed by six places in the last year. Um, there are several areas where we immensely improved, but there are also several areas where we declined or where we are still um, behind. So if we start with, with the government efficiency, actually government efficiency is an area where Slovenia made the biggest jump in a positive way um, in the last five years. Um, so Professor Gorelli, now comes the difficult part. Yeah, yeah. Rigid regulations are always seen as stifling efficiency and innovation. So which, would, which should we focus on really to retain some long-term social peace as well as sustainability in the country? So in your opinion, you know, what should we focus on? Is this taxes, labor regulation, environment, state ownership? What do you think? Well, well, well. Okay. That on? Yeah. Okay, first we apologize to spoil our, your lunch. Uh, <laughs> At least they have food. Yeah, at least we have food. I'm sorry about that. Second, this is a very interesting question, but you have to realize I'm, uh, I'm a foreign guest here. I'm Swiss, I'm neutral, I have no ID. So uh, let me tell you one or two things, however. Uh, I do believe, yes, I mean, uh, Slovenia has improved and has improved in government efficiency. Mm -hmm. And I realize it's always a surprise when you are in a country and somebody says your government has improved. Nobody believes it. But I think things are getting better. I think that um, we have a number of issues everywhere, not only in Slovenia. The first one is that uh, we have an inflation of regulation and rules. And um, I do believe, and I have tried it, I mentioned that in my own country, uh, maybe one of the way out is to have in Parliament a permanent commission for the simplification of laws and regulation. Mm. I think this will avoid that we have a lot of members of Parliament, I'm speaking for my country, not for yours, which only ambition in life is to have a new law with their name on it. And I think at the end of the day, we have one upon the others, and it becomes too complex for everybody. Mm. This is the first one. The second one is taxation. I think we are going to be in a world where there will be an harmonization of tax procedures, but the tax rates, we are going to compete. I'm convinced the US is going to reduce its corporate tax rates. The objective is to go to th from 35% to 15%, and 
I'm convinced that Britain is going to do the same because the only way to justify the Brexit is to lower the tax rate and therefore the pressure on Slovenia and for everybody else will be also on tax rates. And I think we need to get this message across as much as we can to government. And the last thing is, and you have started to do that well in Slovenia, is obviously the transition from state-owned enterprise to the private sector. Mm -hmm. I think those three things would be my priority. But again, uh, this is not an advice, it's just the way I see it, okay? Uh, would you like to say something about it? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you should. Let, let me build on the professor's <laughs> comments. Um, clearly, technology is an enabler. So if we go through the areas the professor mentioned, um, around compliance and certification, there's this balance that we want to strike, isn't there, between um, protecting, enabling, but also freeing up. The role that technology can play is that it can enable the transparency. It can enable better compliance and better certification. And with that, trust goes up, and then the need for further regulation can go down. So that's one area. Uh, taxation. Um, taxation is an important topic. I think that the real question there, again, from a technology point of view, is how do we broaden the tax base? Um, politically, it's expedient, um, so not expedient, it's popular to say, well, and I think we saw this in the, I think the, the Labour Party's manifesto uh, just yesterday, let's tax the top 5%. But if you do the math, although it wins votes, it won't give us the money that we need. So you have to broaden the tax base. So where there is gonna be a downward pressure on taxation, then absolutely the question then becomes is how can technology be an equalizer to have fair and equitable distribution of that taxation would be, I think I would suggest. So that would be uh, two comments. I think your third, your third area was, what was your third area? Privatization of the state-owned Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, of course. Well, state-owned enterprises privatization has been a bumpy road. I think it's fair to say different experiences in different countries. Um, I just, I should disclaim, you've disclaimed your Swiss. I'm, I, my parents are Italian, I was born in Australia, and I have an Irish wife. So I think I, uh, I have my heart on my sleeve, I think out loud, and I enjoy my, uh, my, my whiskey. But on that disclosure, we saw really good examples of privatization in parts of Europe, and we saw some incredibly challenging ones. Again, I would argue the policies are the policies. The question is how can technology play a role to be more transparent and accelerate those policies? So, question for you, Michael. Um, so, what would you say are the most significant factors for, let's say, reducing efficiency? So, people are also, you know, taxes, labor regulations, uh, but do you see some less visible factors here, you know, that really reduce efficiency, that, that has an impact? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it goes back to, to I mean, if you want to have a, a country that is growing, that is competitive, that is innovative, there should be as, as least as possible boundaries, I think, mm -hmm. in kind of having all of you, the business people, the government kind of flourish and do the things they want to do. So I think regulation is an interesting thing in, 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 in being more efficient. I mean, I can give you an example. I'm having discussions with a country, one of my countries, with the, 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 the regulatory authorities about the fact that we are bringing cloud into this country and according to the law of this country, we are becoming a telecom operator as Microsoft, which changes the whole way we need to run our company in the country. And I had a discussion with the guy, I said, look, this, this law is from 1953. And you cannot hold us accountable for a law in 1953 anymore. You need to change yourself. So I think the government needs to be agile and flexible as well and understand what's going on mm -hmm. in driving efficiency in the country and making tough choices or the right choices faster, smoother. So, Mr. Bozic, you're actually coming from in an international company. So, um, is Slovenia really that inefficient, you know, in terms of taxes and, and labor regulations? <clears throat> Depends on uh, which area. First, uh, we are always too critical, uh, let us say, to the conditions we have and to the environment we have. Because if we, I, I used to have, uh, let us say, a lot of experience with Germany, Austria, also partly Switzerland, uh, even, uh, let us say, Ecuador and so on. So if you go to Germany, the bureaucracy is there is also very strong. The difference is that the public officials there are really trying to help you to overcome these bureaucratical procedures. And the speed is higher. That means 
uh, although our officials now starting to understand that, that we pay them in the business and that they, they're somehow mm. expected to help, but then we are coming to this bureaucracy and rules and now it's time to change also the rules and bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, and, but it is progressing. On the other side, we have to be, let us say, also, um, we have to, to, to look at it relatively. For example, in Slovenia, we can register the car, we can do a lot of formalities, on, uh, let us say, uh, in every, uh, what, 50 or five centers in, in, in the country. Go to Germany. You will wait four hours there, and when you will be called, it will take weeks and weeks and weeks. So, I mean, we are in many things, we are better. And plus, um, also that uh, now, geopolitically now, Lately, I'm involved in the, with a lot of financial investors and private equities and so on. I guess now Slovenia is really uh, being recognized as a safe place to invest. And uh, that's why I, I guess we, have, we are now more and more attractive. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, what, uh, it's always the same uh, challenge. And uh, it is the taxation, not of the corp uh, corporations, but it is taxation of the uh, income, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as we all know, and this is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so, if, if we move to actually an area where Slovenia did not perform the best in, in your study, Professor Garelli, um, economic performance is actually something that where we are today lagging, lagging behind, uh, and we also didn't do any progress in the last few years. Um, so, Let's say investments in particular is actually an area where, where we are lagging behind. Um, so what kind of foreigner and also inward investments should we focus on and actually how to attract them? Only easy questions, huh? Um, first of all, I, I would like to say the economic performance, if I look at the GDP of Slovenia, you are doing well. Mm -hmm. You are doing much better than it used in the past, so I think uh, it is in the right direction. Uh, foreign investment, you're right, has been a weak point of Slovenia for many years, for many reasons. I, um, I agree, I think it's a very important point you just mentioned. There are a lot of countries where bureaucracy is very heavy, mm -hmm. but where the bureaucrats know about it and they try to help you. And that's where it makes a big difference, when you have those who say, these are the rules, there is nothing I can do, example India, and those who say, the rules are crazy, I know about it, and I'm going to help you to find a way. And that's what makes a huge difference, despite everything. And <clears throat> uh, I was mentioning also that another possibility we are trying is to have, for example, when you have a request by foreign investors or others, and the request is not accepted within six months, it is considered to be approved. If you have no answers in six months, it is tacitly approved. Mm. And if you do those kind of things, which do exist, for example, at the European Union level for mergers and acquisition, they have six, six months to tell you they open an inquiry or not. If they have not come back to you, it's approved. Huh? And I think this is very powerful because it means that, uh, you know, the bureaucracy has to move fast. Mm -hmm. So you don't really wait for an answer. If the answer doesn't come, you just go ahead. Mm -hmm. So we have little things like that. We can facilitate, you know, the uh, foreign direct investment if you approve the procedure. Also, one of the big issues everywhere is the access to land. Mm. You know, where you make sure you can invest, have a piece of land, and everything is already pre-approved. So you don't say, I want to invest here, and then I have two years to get all the, all the certification and everything mm. for my investment. This is also, I see many countries doing that. They have pieces of land where everything is already pre-approved for this type of building or operation. So you go in, and you move in immediately, provided you respect what this land is for. Mm -hmm. This is very powerful. Uh, so there are many tricks like that which helps you to go around. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, you know that uh, uh, one of the things about taxation, I realize my country and many countries about in Europe, the average 25% of the people don't pay tax just because they are under a certain level of poverty, etc. And this is very bad to give the impression to people that they can have a life without paying tax. They should pay tax, and then we should reimburse them. Which 
Exactly, and that's why you are very right. I think everybody should pay taxes. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the, the negative taxes, I think, is something which is very aware. People, everybody should pay taxes. And then you reimburse those who are in poverty. But at least they realize the price of the service they get by the state. And for me, this is critically important. I actually see Mr. Bozic nodding really heavily on this. So <laughs> would you? Uh, yes. And um, it is uh, one thing uh, additionally. Uh, that um, I, I was just recently in Zurich and trying to attract one investor to invest in our project. And after a careful examination, he was saying, I really like the project. It's my focus, it's the industry. But I made my, some investigations. I never invest in the country where I cannot know for the next 10 years what is the taxation and what is the system. We have in Switzerland, he said to me, 80, 90 years the same uh, tax uh, system. And you, in your country, you have every year different one. So, sorry, I will not decide to, to, to do it. So, this is also how quickly you change and how it is probable that now you have some, uh, let us say, advantages for the investors. And then in one year or two, could be that they would disappear. Where, where is the credibility mm -hmm. of, of, of this, let us say, package? Mm -hmm. Can I just add a, a, a completely different point, moving away from tax, when, when we're talking about economic growth? I think there's three things, skills, skills, and skills. We have to adapt our education system to educate our youngest people in this new reality. The consumption of technology, the consumption of media, is not the same as the creation. And so we shouldn't fool ourselves into believing just because our children use WhatsApp and Facebook and social networking that they're somehow being prepared for the future. They're not. They're not. It's a fallacy. They absolutely have to focus on creation. So that's the first thing. The second is, and I think, Professor, in your presentation you talked about, I think it was Finland and one other country, where everybody's going to university. Yeah. Because of social pressure, peer, I'm a parent, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it, I'm part of the problem. But I was in a market, actually, I, I don't want to keep, I'm not English, but I don't, don't want to keep on coming back to the UK, but they, they introduced something called a modern apprenticeship. Now, I don't know how pervasive this is across Europe, but when I heard about this notion of a modern apprenticeship, it was exciting. It was recognizing that just because you're not academically excellent, doesn't mean you're going to be successful in life. It's actually, a lot of the times, the opposite. A lot of the times, the more academic and your EQ doesn't follow, you can't be successful in business. The most successful people in life have higher EQ, not necessarily IQ. I would argue you need both, of course, but I think there's a fallacy. And then finally, it's about retraining. Again, the professor made an excellent point about social disruption and displacement. Um, the jobs, you know, working class jobs going overseas and white collar, work. I mean, that was a great example of what happened with uh, the president's um, ban. I think we can still call it a ban. They, 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 they debated this for quite some time on, on uh, uh, Saturday Night Live as well, I think. But anyway, the ban did some interesting things because what it stopped was actually very highly skilled and educated people getting back into the country that they actually had mm -hmm. green cards for. It was incredible to watch the reaction in society. Mm -hmm. So this issue, this third issue about how do we retrain displaced workers, I think is the third piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So really helping young people create, helping people to recognize that a, um, an approach to apprenticeship that's modern is exciting, is a future, and then how do we retrain the display? So I would recommend those three things. Mm -hmm. so I, would, I would add a fourth one, because I mean, I think if you have the, and I see that happening all around me in, in countries, if you have the, the ingredients, Joe just, so you have a, favor, a tax, good favorable tax system, you have good people there in the country. The thing is, how do you keep them in the country? Because that's what I see happening in a few of my countries, like Green, very highly skilled people, very technical, great ideas, very innovative, startup kind of country. And the government is really pushing for that. Georgia is doing the same. But the funny thing is, every time those startups or people become successful, they take their bags and they go to the UK or to Silicon Valley, and they're gone. And that's a big struggle they have. How do you keep the people in the country? Mm. 
by focusing on health, by focusing on, well, kind of the, the good ways to live there and all that stuff, starting innovation hubs and all those things. I think it's, it's, it's a, probably a puzzle of many different things eh? you need to fix as a, as a country mm -hmm. or as a business community. But Michael, do you think there is a magic stick to actually get back the people that actually left for the, let's say, for the foreign experience and then five years later they're back in the country? Is there a magic... Well, I mean, Armenia, Armenia had this big... But I call it not the diaspora because that's something else. But they had this big exit of very qualified people mm -hmm. years ago. And what they're doing, the government, it's one of the big pillars of the government. They're trying to get those Armenians back because there's truckloads of very successful Armenians all over the world. And they're really trying to pull those people back. Mm -hmm. And they're coming back mm -hmm. with, with good tax laws, with good housing. There's good education, good health care, good stuff for their kids, etc., etc. And those people say, hmm, why not go back to Armenia and contribute to the country? And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's going very well. Mm -hmm. There's a, I can share the link. There's a website which talks about that, and it's pretty impressive what they do there. Mm -hmm. yes. can, I, can I just yeah. one second? I give you the magic trick. Um, we, uh, we have given instruction to our consulate of Switzerland around the world. They look at the expat, and there is a moment in life which is critical to go back, is when your children are leaving primary school and they will have to go to secondary school. And every family is asking itself, if I don't take the decision now to go back home, we will never go back home. Am exactly. I correct? So what we have given as instruction to our consulate is to contact everybody at that stage and say, why don't you go back home now? <laughs> why don't you go back and pay your taxes in Switzerland and all that? But this is a critical time in the life of every expat, primary to secondary school. This is. Very good. It's very, it's, very, it's very funny you say this. I mean, just, I mean, I live in Dubai, the UAE, and you see exactly that happening there. In well, Dubai. Well-known Eastern European country. Yeah, well, no, but I, I know, it's a well-known European country. Yeah, no, no, but a long time ago it was. No, but I'm, I mean, it's so true because there, there's, there's hardly any universities in Dubai because all the expats leave the moment the kids have to go to the universities. Like you said, they go somewhere to London. Now oh, we go back to London now until there's hundreds of primary schools. But there's no university. It's exactly 100% true. It's very funny. Mr. Rojic, you wanted to add something? Yeah, just um, the professor has uh, mentioned uh, in, the, in the presentation he made uh, for association of managers. What about blue colors? And this is what you were uh, talking. Um, we have a lot of people, 40, 45 years old. Now, digitalization, robotization, even in the company I'm still running, it's, we have this, this case. We could fire them years ago. What would they do? They are not skilled. They don't have the knowledge to, to, to be in IT or whatever in, uh, to, to deal with the robots. But of course, we have to create, as you were mentioning, the jobs for the blue color, uh, blue, uh, color people. Um, and uh, this is then, uh, if we will not do it, we, cannot, we can forget the uh, investment and uh, normal society because the people will be on the streets. They will have not the income. Uh, so we have two solutions. We develop the jobs for them, to, and this is the job is also dignity, is also self-confidence and so on. Or we have to get, get to, to give them this universal social income. Somehow they have to get uh, the, the, the money to survive. But this is the serious problem that we have. The growing demand of, uh, let us say, skilled people, which you cannot get now anymore, even in Slovenia, very often. And this is also partly because I was so glad that you mentioned, and I know from Germany that it could be different, that we believe that if you didn't finish the university, that you're stupid. And it's just the opposite. They're very clever people, but they have different intelligence. I'm a little bit involved in HR, and we, we know this now. And there are 25 different types of intelligence and so on. They are highly skilled, highly intelligent people, and we need them in industry. And for these blue jobs, we need them. Um, so if, if we continue with, um, let's say, the infrastructure topic itself, you know, and, and we go maybe a bit deeper. Um, Joe, you actually have a, you, will, you have been working with governments for, I don't know, 20 years or, or even more. Um, so what do you see as innovative policies or best practices in terms of infrastructure investment? So is this going in the direction of education, actual infrastructure, help? Health. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going through a transformation. If you asked me the question, let's say 10 years ago, 
it was all about the broadband infrastructure. And it still is. We're still finishing the last mile in many parts of the world. But the rationale was clear. If you're a small business, you can compete on the global economy and global market. Mm -hmm. if, you're a, a, if you're a small uh, country, you can, have, you can punch above your weight in terms of impact of economic development and growth. So the building out of broadband infrastructure, uh, supporting schools, supporting hospitals, was the answer, still is the answer. It's necessary but not sufficient. The big focus today is about building out data centers. That's, that's the thing that everybody's um, focused on. Um, and many governments, uh, you mentioned uh, Germany as an example, would be a good example. I think this country is another good example. Many countries have done this. They've built the cloud infrastructure. And I think that's a good thing. And we should help the government leverage that infrastructure. But to put this into context, and this is not being, please don't take this as an arrogant comment or a judgmental comment. It's a factual comment. Um, between Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, the amount of investment that's going into that infrastructure is unmatchable by any government in the world, including actually the US. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft today is investing a billion dollars a month on capital investment. That's outside of the $10 billion research and development per year a billion dollars a month to build out not just in what we call infrastructure as a service, so the basic provision, but artificial intelligence. How we create cognitive platforms, how do we create the HoloLens demo mm -hmm. that I think Michael showed, augmented reality. This technology is accelerating, so I think there has to be a balance going forward that those countries that really understand that where they can invest they should invest, and where they can leverage global scale, they should absolute level. We're seeing probably the most, coming back to your question, where we're seeing this accelerating the most, I would argue the Netherlands mm -hmm. and the Nordic countries from a government mm -hmm. and broader is still pre pretty much leading here. And especially if I look at northern, um, uh, northern Europe with people aged, you know, aged care, people in the community, especially when you live in the hinterlands and you want to access... Um, uh, healthcare service, education services. Again, this sort of technology makes a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to say the biggest problem you may have is whether the regulation is going to follow. Because the government are going to say, for example, with cloud technology, you know the big debate, I mean, where is it? Uh, how can I ensure that this information one day will not go somewhere else? Um, what happened when somebody dies? What happened with all the information? Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of rules which for the moment are still open. And if I would be a young lawyer today, I would advise them to go in this field mm -hmm. because these tremendous opportunities because everything has to be done in the new law of technology because of what you are doing now because the frontiers are not the frontiers of the states anymore. Mm -hmm. And the law is really directed to a country. So actually today, this is a very big issue. I mean, uh, you know, the information, where is it? And who is responsible of the integrity of this information? Who is responsible of the legacy of this information when something happened? I think it is a tremendously interesting subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I agree, but I also think it's it's, it's something that will be solved. I mean, we have banks. Switzerland has many banks. Uh, the, don't ask the banks. No, no, well, maybe <laughs> banks. No, but I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, 5,000 years ago, you would get paid in shelves or whatever you could pay, and you put it in old sock under your bed. And then this guy or girl came and said, hey, I'm a bank. Give me your money. I give you a plastic card. And wherever in the world you put your card in the machine, I give you money. You don't worry about that either, right? It's not always a good example, I agree, but mostly it works. And I think that's regulated. Banks are regulated. I mean, you could see us as the, the bank of data, very heavily regulated, very heavily inspected, very like, heavily controlled. And, and I think that's where we're going. It will take time. But it's, it's a good future job, for sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. Huh? Uh, it's very interesting I'm because... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You are a lot of added value. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think the key question at the end of the day is... You're in which industry sector? What kind of a company are you? 
Because the same, the same is taking place now with Facebook and all those guys where everybody is there and saying, actually, you are a media company. Mm -hmm. But they, re they say, no, 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 no. Because if we say we are a media company, we are subjected to the law on media company in the US. And, and this is critical because then you have to redefine not only under which jurisdiction you are, but what kind of company you are because then there is a specific law which depends on what kind of company you are. So if you say suddenly, I am a telecommunication company, you are in a different ball game. And I, oh, fascinating. I'm happy I'm only a professor. I don't have to solve that one. Um, so, Mr. Bozic, if, if we continue with, with the topics, um, you've based the Klarna harassment restructuring and the revival on keeping jobs. Um, what is the company's relationship with robotics and how do you, sh do you see the new technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation happening right now? It's extremely important. Um, they, th there is a guess that in uh, glass industry production, there are every second 10,000 different facts influencing your quality and output. So you have tremendous data which you have to control and digest and convert into something usable. Our problem till now was that the first, of course, the project was socially oriented, so we didn't fire people if it was really not necessary because uh, of the social responsibility. But on the other side, there was also not enough available technology uh, on, the, um, on the market because everybody was doing the solutions just for the mass in the industry, not for us being specialized and uh, flexible, changing and so on. But now it's coming. We are even developing this with the uh, suppliers. So I guess with this new, tremendous, uh, fast machines, ultra, ultra HD cameras and so on, it gives fantastic opportunities that we will have all this data more controlled, that we will have wind, humidity, pressure, all these installations, whatever and so on, that we can put into the one model algorithm, self-learning. Partly we are doing this already. And this is really tremendous, uh, let us say, help. So this, we, are, we are in the middle of that, so mm -hmm. for us it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. Okay, glass industry is a little bit behind. It was, there were other industries before uh, going through this, uh, so let us say like uh, paper or uh, others. So we are still, uh, I'm the same behind because in normal industry you have from the raw materials till the finished product, you have one system you can control. We have still silos, we have still islands. We're not coming then uh, to this to connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for us it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for me it's this also possible to, let us say, make reasonable costs for a very personalized um, product. Because you will send me by internet from New York something, I can do it then in seconds and then mm -hmm. deliver it within the hours and so on. This is then really uh, helping. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, automation, robotics, and everything, it always touches people at the end, you know, and in my opinion, people are still, you know, the most important part of everything that, that we do. Um, and with people, it's always the mindset that we have, and it's a national culture, the national mindset that we, say, that, that, that we have, and this is probably one of my favorite topic, you know, topics, you know, be positive, be brave, be everything. Um, and Professor Garelli, you, you started this in your, in your keynote today already, this topic. Um, and I, I strongly believe that there is a mindset behind the competitiveness. Uh, but does Slovenia have enough of, of it? And what can actually governments and companies do to, to be better in this positive national mindset? It's a difficult question, I know. <laughs> like the other ones, yes. Huh? Um, I think the, 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 the best way to change a mindset is yourself to embody the mindset you want to see in the company. Mm. You have to be a role model. It's very simple. Because every employee will reproduce what they see above them. And if they see people who are really having their management culture in line with the corporate values, then they will change. Mm. If top management says, this is a corporate value, but it does not apply to me because I do it differently, then you get into a mess very quickly. Mm -hmm. So for me in a company, the best way to make things change is to make sure that the managers at every level are the one who represent the mindset which you want to have in the company. Because people, they don't need to have things explained. I agree with you with the academic world. I mean, we are lousy at explaining things. The 
you know, professors is one of the two pro um, jobs in the world which has not changed in the past 2,000 years. I won't tell you what is the other one. But this is really something where we have never changed. And we should do something about it. And in companies, we should really understand that people, they reproduce what they see more than they, what they understand. Mm -hmm. I would just do an advert, not for Microsoft, but uh, an author called Carol Dwork, and the book is called Growth Mindset. Um, if you're familiar with it, or if you heard about it, uh, if you haven't, I would recommend, if you're into reading about this topic, it's an excellent piece of work. Um, it's actually a piece of work that has significantly influenced the transformation in our organization. Um, I've been with the company for 21 years, um, so joined the company when Bill Gates was CEO, very specific leadership style. Then Steve Baumer was our CEO, a very different leadership style, and now Satya Nadella is our current CEO, and he has been heavily influenced by this work. It's something that if you asked, I, I, would, challenge, I would probably take a risk, but if you asked anybody in Microsoft today out of 100,000 employees what growth mindset means, they'll give you pretty much the same answer. It won't be exactly the same answer. So I think the professor is absolutely spot on. It starts with leadership. It starts with embodiment of the change that you want to drive. Then, of course, your leadership team. Then, of course, your frontline managers. They are the most critical people in this equation to drive change. But if you're clear about where you want to go, if you generate energy around you, people will come with you, and then you'll have your success. Not much to add, I think, on that one. There's one. No, but I mean, I think it, it's getting the right people in that. And Satya made a very interesting statement a few weeks ago. Maybe you've read that. That he says he's not hiring for people who know everything. He's hiring for people who want to learn everything. I think that's a fantastic phrase in, in how we think well, in Microsoft. Learn it all, not know it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I, I, this is my topic. I would like to add something. Um, I hope that you are familiar with the uh, so-called quantum leadership, uh, because um, as we know that the 1928, the uh, physics were joining and saying the, it is the end of the Newtonian physics, now we are coming to the philosophy. And uh, so this is the fact. Today, all the laws in the universe, we cannot anymore um, prove by the, let us say, laboratory um, observations and so on, even the quantum physics are saying, by observing, you're changing the subjects, which is the true, but we have no time to go into details. And this is a big law of uncertainty under, in, in the subatomic atomic level. And why I'm ta talking, this, uh, talking about this, because we can see the huge, especially huge companies like this organization with subatomic quantum particles. You believe that you have a lean organization, you have structures, you have computers, you have procedures, you have models, and they will function. They will not function. And then uh, how could you glue them together? First, they are extremely, as you were mentioning, uh, in, uh, important, the values. You have to put the people with the selected values you, you like and which could contribute to, to, to the success together. And second, those particles, people, are not running like uh, you predict in the models, because they are today unhappy. Perhaps the, the son is in the hospital, and so on and so on, and you still expect them that they will do the same performance. So how would they do it? That they would know why they should do it. So that means the purpose, the mission is so important, and you have to motivate the people with the positive, uh, let us say, motivational factors, not Maslow. First you eat and drink, and then you do the rest. It's just the opposite. You believe in something and you fight for it. Mm -hmm. And this is the quantum leadership principle. I mean, we have to talk about it long and long. I'm just happy to announce that from Monday 1st, uh, I hope to get the certificate of master, let us say, uh, quantum leadership uh, together with my wife. So we, we could be in Slovenia. We are 20% of quantum leadership experts together with Dana Zohar. So we, let's make some promotion of that. <laughs> and that means we could, re, as a small country, as Dana is saying, and a lot of other products, we could be the example. We could really make a change. Mm -hmm. And I believe if we would do in the company's uh, lead, uh, in different leadership, and a lot of good examples we have already in Slovenia, mm -hmm. 
that's why it's so successful some so many companies that we could make the the model for for the let us say new capitalism because this was the question now also in the association of managers will the capitalism collapse or this uh, will destroy it or whatever it's evolving and uh, it's uh, if we will change it in this way that uh, people will be really knowing what is their role why they're that they are important part of this let us say that they are contributing. What is their mission, and so on? Mm -hmm. And then, if everything will be sustainable, also to the the planet, to the environment, social environment, then of course could be also sustainably successful. That's actually a very interesting view. Um, so, because we are quite quite short on time, because Professor Gorelli has to leave uh, for the airport, um, I'm now asking: Is are there any questions from the audience? You know, we would appreciate. Your questions. You were so good in asking questions yourself. <laughs> but still, you know, for Professor, you know, the four of us, we can continue with the de debate, but unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to Professor Garelli. So. No, I have, yeah, I have a question <laughs> yeah. for her. No. Uh, I want, first, I want to apologize if I have to leave. It's not my fault. It's because uh, the Italians have reinstated Schengen uh, border control because of the G7 taking place uh, next weekend. So big Q, etc. They believe that a certain president may be at stake. I don't know, but uh, we are, uh, we will not do it. Um, I, I just want to share a little things about the importance of people. When I was very young, I worked a little bit with. I'm sorry, another company. Uh, Yolette Packard and Bill Yulet. And once I asked Bill Yulet, what was the best management decision you have ever made in your life? And he told me it was after the war. We had plenty of engineers available after the war effort. They left the government, they left the war effort, and they were on the market. So he said, I went to see uh, Dave Packard and I tell him, we hire everybody. And then uh, Dave Packard told him, are you crazy? We have nothing to do with that. We have no jobs for them. He said, I don't care. If we have intelligent people in the company, we will always find something to do. And this was, he told me, the brightest decision I haven't taken in my life because this is when suddenly the company was from zero and exploded. A lot of intelligent people. There is one thing you never can do wrong in a company. You hire bright, intelligent people who are motivated for success. They have to be angry. They have to be angry for success. And younger than us. That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gorilla, for being with us. Um, now maybe. You can speak whatever you want. <laughs> Maybe the last question from audience from, from my side, and this is for, for, for Mr. Božić. Um, so do we as Slovenian dream big enough? You know, once you said that, you know, from, that we expect so much from sports people as Slovenians, and you know that in, Sloven in Slovenia, you know, sports is not, a, it's not, it, it's actually, we are extremely successful at sports, and the size is not a burden here. But do we dream big enough? As more and more, uh, we see a lot of good examples. And uh, yeah, I, in the past, I was sometimes when we even uh, let us say having the workshops with the companies, I was really observing this lack of ambition. Mm -hmm. Also, in my previous life, being country manager at that time of ABB, I was addressing, in the name of ABB, uh, let us say the companies here. And then uh, we could make the center of excellence for uh, ABB in metering and so on. You know, I would not mention other companies. And the, the managing director was saying, well, we are big enough, I guess. We are fine. So, I mean, you know, this, this is what, what I mean. And uh, that's why I'm now dreaming in, in this glass factory. Mm -hmm. We're bankrupt. Uh, so everybody was laughing when we were with my wife joined there. But now we are one of the premium producers mm -hmm. and we are dreaming. I don't know if we will do it. Now we are in the middle of the merger acquisition process, cross-sharing, whatever we'll see. And, but okay, let's consolidate this business. I, I guess a lot of people are dreaming like this in Slovenia. That's why we have a lot of good cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are more and more uh, having dreamers, especially in startups and so on. They're dreamers. I mean, they, can, can you see, I mean, this, this is really incredible. That's why I'm optimistic, mm -hmm. especially with the people younger, like here sitting, this is different. My generation already, I'm now 57. 
sadly, sometimes they're satisfied that they could make the golf and they make some, let us say, yachting, and that's it. And, but the young, they are uh, hungry for the success and they are different. And you can see also in the, our consultancy that young people, second level now in the companies, being 35, 37, 39, now coming, and they're looking for this kind of knowledge because the old guys still, they're sitting in the boards, mm -hmm. they're blocking them, but they will come. Mm -hmm. Very optimistic. Mm -hmm. So, any questions? You are quite public today. Okay. Um, so, dear guests, thank you for being here with us. It was a pleasure. We learned a lot. So with constant investment and with the right mindset, we are actually on the way to the stars, or how? Okay. So... Uh, Thank you also, dear audience. Now I'm also leaving you to finish your lunches. And at 3 o'clock exactly, we start and continue also with the, with the sessions uh, in the whole Europa. Thank you.